So like I said, it's uh, not a big day, but we are introducing, he's pausing to make sure he's not telling you, I think we're introducing the final chapter in your trail guide. you think I would know that off the top of my head, but actually, yeah, we're introducing the, the last chapter of your trail guide. Now we are going to go back, we skipped some chapters, we skipped head and arms basically, head and forearms and hands, but so we're going to go back to those. But this will take us... We've kind of started with the upper body and worked our way down, and this will take us to the complete foundation um, of your body. So um, bear with me on this because legs and feet are obviously the foundation of your entire structure, and they're pretty important. And it, this is an area of weakness for most massage therapists, and not because it's a particularly tricky area. It's not really any trickier than anything else you've learned. It's because... Um, Schools sometimes teach it last, and so it doesn't get really taught really well. People over-focus on the back, and they, you know, they can tell you about the back muscles, but they can't tell you anything about arms and legs. Um, you know, they just don't get into detail about that. They feel overwhelmed by the amount of muscles on the feet and later in the hands, and so they tend to kind of just gloss over them and go, well, that's not so important. Um, you guys know this from me, but I'm of the exact opposite camp. I, I would rather a therapist know everything about the feet than about the shoulders. Uh, and I challenge you to find somebody with messed up feet who doesn't have a messed up posture. So I think it's just about impossible. So I think we've got the order all switched. Um, anyway, uh, so legs and foot, we're just going to talk about bones today. So uh, before I get that, though, this will help you with tonight's homework assignment. Uh, because one of them is just an introduction to the chapter where they say, hey read this story and then try to tell us about what might be going on with this guy. Um, and the other one is some questions on the bones of, of the legs and feet. So, but anyway, the this, this story, I don't, it's been a while since I've read it, but um, I suspect the story is actually talking about either somebody who's an athlete or in boot camp or something where they're running a lot and they're getting pain in their legs. And this is a super common complaint. So how many of you have experienced or had somebody tell you that they had shin splints? Cool. All right. So shin splints are kind of interesting. Um, it's a term that has actually changed over the last 25 years, in my opinion. Um, and originally, originally shin splints meant hairline fractures in your tibia uh, or your fibula but usually your tibia. And you got them, they were stress fractures, they would call them. And that doesn't mean you've actually broken the bone like a compound fracture, right? Where you break it and it's sticking through the skin or something. Um, these are hairline fractures that would show up in a really detailed uh, x-ray or something, but you can still walk around on them and they're from constant impact. And that used to be shin splints. Um, and they do happen. Uh, but the term doesn't usually mean that anymore. People usually use shin splints to uh, instead uh, mean um, periosteitis. So, which has nothing, which is not, is not fra uh, little fractures in your tibia. Periosteitis is, well, what is periosteitis? Can anybody break down that word? Even part of it. Yes, yes. Uh, Ms. Routson, please. Well, doesn't itis mean inflammation? And so that would be inflammation of the periosteum? Yes! So she is 100% correct. Itis means uh, inflammation, and, and that must mean inflammation of the periosteum. So now she's right. What's the periosteum? It is the fascia-like coating over your bones that your muscles and tendons attach to. Yes, ma'am. We talked about it a long time ago when we did bones, but we haven't talked about it since then. So remember, this is really critical, actually, because you guys will be dealing with not just shin splints, but these types of aches and pains. So um, remember that what do tendons do? What do they do? They attach what to what? Anybody? Muscle to bone. Muscle to bone. Yeah. So, but what that makes people think of is they think, well, I've got a, I've got a big bone here. Right? Or 
right? And I've got a muscle that's kind of comes over here and that is literally kind of screwed into the bone. And by the way, in surgery, they actually do screw tendons into bones when they've torn off or whatever, right? And this is where the trail guide of the body really makes a lot of sense to me, where they show somebody climbing the body and things like that. If you were climbing the side of a mountain and you had to put an anchor in the mountain and you screwed into the side of the mountain, that would work, but I hope you see that the only place that your ropes are hooked to is where that screw is screwed into the mountain. And if you put a lot of force on it and that stone gives away, it kind of comes out. And your tendons are under incredible, incredible amounts of force. I want to repeat that. In order for my, my soleus gastrocnemius and plantaris to do a plantar flexion and lift this 225 pounds or whatever it is I weigh right now up, they actually have to pull much harder. And that's because the levers of my foot actually work against lifting heavy objects. The levers of my foot actually work against lifting heavy objects. If this is my foot here and this is my tibia, this is not a lot of lever over here to pull on to lift my foot up. When you guys use a crowbar, you don't, you don't grab on just the end of the crowbar and try to pull right there. You try to get a really long crowbar to give yourself strength. The longer the lever, the more strength it seems to give you. What do shorter levers give you? Why would, why would God, Gaia, Darwin, why would God make ankles like this? Where honestly, I'm not exaggerating, your calf probably has to generate 2,000 pounds of force to lift up a 200 pound body. Very weird. Yes, Miss Mejia, please. Um, we've actually talked about this before. Um, well, I think you and I did. And you were saying that when it's shorter, um, it it's for um, not power, but like distance. Speed. So like, yeah, And distance. Speed. I love what you said. Yeah. So let's, I don't know if I've got enough lever here to show you, but we're going to try because it's pretty, this is, this is really important to kinesiology. All right. So, if my lever, this is my lever right now, and this is the thing over here that we're moving. If my lever is short, I can pull this down just an inch, but how much does this part move up? I don't know what that amount is, but I'm only moving my little finger down here, half inch, and what's this thing moving up over there? Six inches? Now, it's harder to pull this. It's a lot easier to pull this if I put my finger, this thing almost pulls itself now. But what happens is if I put my finger way back here, I've got lots of power. I pull this a little bit, but does this end over here move? Hardly at all. So this is how we lift up a big heavy rock. We get a big long lever, we push it way down, we put lots of distance into it to get a little power out of it. But your muscles, when they contract, we all think that when I'm doing stuff like this, that my bicep is contracting the whole area. And actually what it's doing is pulling a little bit on a lever and getting a lot of distance out of it. So. If your muscles just contract a little bit on an ankle, you get a lot of foot movement. But the problem is you gotta pull really hard. So your muscles, everybody, travel very little. They pull very little, but they pull very hard. And you were designed for speed, not power. So you shall be impressed with yourself because when you're in the gym squatting 100 pounds or 200 pounds or 300 pounds, your muscles are actually squatting something like 10,000 pounds. It's ridiculous what they have to do because your, mu your muscles are designed for speed, not power. Your joints are designed for speed, not power. Yeah? So, here's the kicker. If you've got tendons inserted down in this bone down here, which is your heel, and they're pulling with 2,000 pounds of force, and they were just screwed into that heel, it'd be very easy for them to rip loose. And it would be very bad. But they're not just screwed into your heel. They're actually woven into the fascia of your heel. Very much like Spider-Man when he's swinging through the city and he flips out his web 
And yes, the web kind of comes together and comes down to a nice fine point, but it's over the whole side of the building grabbing onto it. Well, periosteum is the fascia around your bone. So if you've got our big bone up here again, right? But it's covered with this gorgeous fascia all over it. And really the tendon looks like it inserts right here, and it does, but very much like Spider-Man, it weaves out through here. We can't really tell that because it just becomes part of the, the tendon becomes part of the periosteum. It's very hard to rip off the bone. I'm not saying it doesn't happen. But when you're pulling on that bone, you're actually not pulling on one point. You're pulling on a spider web, pulling on a bone that's wrapped around the whole bone. It's brilliant. Here's what's a little bit more mind-blowing. I think it's super mind-blowing, by the way. And I think it's where I would like you guys to consider going in your brains. Because you were adorable freshmen four or five months ago, we had to tell you some very simple stories, right? Just like when kids are little, you tell them very simple stories, right? Um, because they're not ready for the whole information, so to speak. And so we told you, muscles only contract. That's still true, by the way. But we said muscles only contract. Muscles are hooked to bone via tendons. Bones are hard calcium and potassium, right? All that's essentially true. But here, in my opinion, is what's more true. Oh. What's more true, and I can prove it to you a little bit here, what's more true is that you're a big fascial sack. And part of that fascial sac, we put contractile tissue in, right here, and then we call this whole thing muscle. But it really it was all fascia, and then we put some contractile tissue in here. And by the way, this bone was all fascia, and we filled it in with calcium. Really, you are a never-ending web of fascia that's filled in with different things in between. And we know this because when people break their bones, and we look at it under, uh, whatever we look at it under, uh, <coughs> we actually see fascia grow back first, like kind of like, like a web of like pantyhose or something kind of grow back first, and then we see it fill in with potassium and calcium. And when you guys cut into a steak, the reason that steak is held together, yes, the red meat of the steak is, is meat, it's contractile tissue, but all the stuff that's keeping that meat together is fascia. You really are a fascia baby, <laughs> full of like muscles in certain pockets and then calcified fascia. It's almost like your body said, I don't even think it's almost, but it's almost like your body said or Mother Nature said or God said, I've got to make this person, they've got to be strong, they've got to be light, they have to be able to pull, but they always got to be loose, they got to be rigid in certain areas. And so it created all this fascial network, and it's like, well, let's fill in the, the stuff that needs to be really hard with calcium and potassium. And I don't know if any of you guys worked with plaster of Paris when you were kids. Okay. Or even paper mache in a way. Those things get their structure from the fibers that you put them on, right? <clears throat> if you took socks of yours, old socks, and you poured paper mache in there, or, or you poured plaster of Paris in there, you would have a solid, because it would actually bleed into the fibers of the sock, and it would actually make it stronger than just having it the way it is normally. Let me give you another example. Concrete's really amazing stuff, but you never see them build a highway without putting rebar in it. It really is the thing that makes the concrete stronger. And fascia really is the thing that makes your bones so strong. There really is a fascial network, not just wrapping around the bone, but in the bone that's filled in with calcium and potassium. And your muscle really is a fascia network. This is more accurate. All this is tendon. All of it's tendon. All of it's tendon with some green contractile tissue in between the tendon. 
It's all Ted. It's all fascia. Yes, Miss Mejia. So if you're saying that we're just like fascia sacs with different stuff in it, then why why is it that people don't think this way? Is it because they don't know what fascia is because it's not talked about? Or do you think, um, is that, I don't understand. Like, yeah. Because if it's such this, this, you know, unique concept that explains a lot of stuff, why don't, why isn't it more talked about? Like, because I, I never even heard about fascia yeah. before yeah. this. I, by the way, when I went to massage school, I didn't hear about it either. The word was not mentioned once, not once. Um, and it is a new thing, but not like new crazy Tapscott thing. Like, they, like I said, they have a world conference on fascia now. Like it's an accepted medical thing. If you talk to doctors about it, like it's not a weird thing. We didn't know. So this is super exciting, right? And I mean, no disrespect to the medical community. They do some amazing things, but they don't know anything. <laughs> Neither do I. Here's what I mean by that. Look at our solutions medically for stuff right now. Right? If you have cancer, what do we do? Irradiate it and chop it off. Right? And I'm not, we haven't gotten much, we're trying to get more advanced than that, but we haven't. Even our virus stuff, even this COVID stuff, what we did was we said, well, if we get a little bit of the virus and we put it in you, but not enough to kill you, you'll build an immunity to it. That, I'm not saying that's not smart, but it's not genius really. It's saying like, well, if I cough on you a little bit, you'll kind of build up immunity to cough. We're using your body to do that. Bodies are amazing. Nobody's denying that. But the medical field and massage, and all of us, this is not me putting down the medical field, we don't know that much. Like, we really don't. And so when we discovered muscles, we got really excited about them because we knew that they moved the body. And so very much, we're very new at this. If you think about it, modern medical science has only been around a couple hundred years. And I really can't call the stuff more than a hundred years ago modern. It was pretty bad. I mean, they didn't even know how germs were, were, they didn't even understand why you should wash your hands before you touch somebody during surgery. That was just 100 years ago. They literally didn't know that. They're like, we can't figure out why people are dying. They had this very, I'm getting off on a tangent here, but they had this very famous doctor who couldn't figure out why the women they were helping birth seemed to die so much more at the hospital. And they, they realized the guys that were helping them birth, the doctors helping birth were working in the cadaver lab before. And they were literally taking disease and, you know, we just didn't know that stuff. So anyway, we didn't know. And then people came along and they said, well, these muscles work. We know they pull and bones are levers, so they must pull on the bones. And that's true. But somebody very brilliant, I don't know who, came along, several somebodies, by the way, came along and said, that model's not even completely correct because actually if your bones were just hitting on each other all the time, they would just wear themselves down. Even with you healing, it's just too much. Like the pounding you're talking about is just too much. And they started to realize that actually you're hung more like a suspension bridge and, and that you're in this big fascial network that actually prevents stuff from pounding together all the time. And that's very hard to visualize. And I don't know if you'll be able to see this well enough to, visual, to see it, but I'm going to pull... Let's see if I can get this right. Okay, look at these two sticks here. Okay, this is a fascial network. That's why I have it here. It's tensegrity is what it's called. Fascial networks, when they're linked by this, these, these wooden dowels are your bones, but none of the dowels touch each other, and yet it has form. And guess what happens? When I pull these two apart, these two will move apart too. And when I push these together, the other ones will actually get closer together. You'll have to come play with it in lab, but that's actually how your body works through this distribution of force, which is why when you step down on your foot, all the bones in your foot don't break. They're in a fascial network and they're meant to float around and distribute weight. Um, it's like when you ever walked off a step someplace and you didn't know the step was there and you're like, oh, that shock wave goes through your body and the step was only this much, but you weren't ready for it. Um, that is your body's ability to distribute stuff through your fascial network. It's the reason your bones don't break. And we started to discover like, oh my gosh, like most things in life, um, we didn't realize how complex it was. And it's why I even said with like reflexology and stuff, um, these weren't the conversations we could have four months ago. That's why I'm bringing all this up. With reflexology, I'm like, I think it probably works, but I, I suspect we're wrong about why it works. 
because we were wrong about so many other things about the body. It's very miraculous. And we're still learning about really fairly simple mechanical things and fascia's part of them. But anyway, that's why you haven't heard about it, is it wasn't thought of before. People were just like, oh, it's gristle in the body. And yeah, and they're like, well, we see some really thick fascia that holds the muscle onto the, onto the bone. And then people started to come along and go, well, but the bone's got fascia all through all the whole thing. And when you guys were born, you were fascial babies. You had very little bone in you. Your heads came out all cone-shaped. You looked all funky. You couldn't, I, you couldn't, I know this is ridiculous, but you couldn't birth me now, right? My head would not like, I realize I'm a grown man, but my point is my head wouldn't collapse. It wouldn't do the stuff it's supposed to do. I'm not rubbery like that. You know, kids bounce because they're mostly made of cartilage. And what happens is they calcify later. But you start out fascia and it never goes away. You just calcify some of those areas. So that's why you haven't heard of it. It really is fairly new. Uh, and the exciting thing about all this is exactly what I've been telling you guys. It's so new that you will discover ways to treat people that nobody's thought of before. Massage moves and techniques and possibly even healing modalities of how the body really works literally by screwing around with your clients and trying out stuff because doctors are still figuring it out. The only cool thing is 25 years ago, doctors were like, oh, you're a massage therapist. Now they, they have a really high degree of respect for what we do because they've now admitted that they've come across problems that massage will help that they don't know how to solve. They literally don't know what to do with carpal tunnel. They don't know what to do with TMJ. They don't know what to do with sciatica. And if they tell you they do, ask them their success rate, and then they'll come back and be like, oh, it's actually pretty bad. So, yeah, it's all new. Yep. What did you say um, massage was to, like, other medical things? It was paramedical? Is that the word that you'd use? Um... I don't think I used paramedical, just because it doesn't sound familiar to me. I don't know. I can't think of the word, um, but like people would use like uh, a GP along with a massage therapist, and there was like a word that it was used as like as like an adjunct. Yeah, like supplemental kind of thing. Yeah. Yeah. We're synergists. Oh. Yeah, I like that. Um, yeah, and and that's actually some of the most exciting stuff because. Like, I really believe in physical therapy, and I really believe in chiropractics, and I unfortunately believe there's times for surgery, and there's times for massage, but really those things all go very well together. You know, because if you get surgery, you better have rehab, you better have a physical therapist, and you better have massage afterwards, right? And massage and physical therapy might help you avoid the severity of that surgery. There's just all sorts of stuff. Yeah. And this doesn't even get into the stuff that I'm really into that I don't try not to overly push because it's a matter of opinion. And it's your personal preference, and it almost borders on religious conviction. But I think there's this huge mental aspect of all this, right? I'm a big believer that how you think and feel affects your physical body. Um, and I think we're going to see more of that, too, where it really is important the state the client's in. Whereas just 25 years ago, uh, a surgeon would never say it mattered that you came to surgery in a good mood or not. They'd be like, you either have the physical comp the composition and constitution to survive surgery or you don't. Now they really recognize that like cancer rates are higher with people with the right mental attitude. Surgery, survive, all this stuff. So that's a whole other aspect too. And I love that massage touches on that. That you, I, That's again why I said I think that we probably cure a lot of stuff that we're never aware of and not for the reasons we think. I've rubbed people before many years ago and thought, oh, and they got better. And I thought, oh, I fixed you. And I did kind of, but I might have actually fixed them by making them feel emotionally and mentally better, not by rubbing them. Or I might have been the rubbing. I don't know. My point is it's, it, this is a very open field. We are brand new. We really are. Not just massage therapists, medical stuff. Even the stuff that we take so much pleasure and delight in. Yes, we've gone to the moon. That is like le a flea leaping off a dog's back. It's commendable and amazing, but we haven't really gone anywhere. We can't leave our solar system. We can't defy space and time. We haven't learned how to really extend human life beyond telling people not to drink and smoke so much. Like, we are really newbies in this, and that's very exciting. And so this, you're going to see a lot of this, Miss Mejia is you're going to see it during your lifetime just a continuation of lots and lots of advancements, including the massage field. So in a way, 
even though you're in one of the oldest professions, not the oldest profession, but one of the oldest professions, uh, <coughs> it's brand new. It's brand spanking new. Yeah, it's very cool. Sorry, that's... No, I mean, I, I like listening. I mean, I, I distract you. <laughs> yeah, no, but it's true. And I couldn't, I couldn't say everything I just said touched on 14 different things that we've discussed here, but we couldn't say that day one. It would make no sense. What's this guy talking about? Levers and fashion? You know, you know, we've got to learn about bones and muscles first. Yeah. And the bones and muscles are important. They're just linked in a seamless web of fascia everywhere. At all levels, too. It's not just wrapped around the bone. It's through the bone. It's not just wrapped around the muscle. It's through the muscle. You can't, if there's a reason, and we, we, we knew this 25 years ago. They said connective tissue is the most abundant tissue in the body. We knew that 25 years ago, but we never realized what that meant. If connective tissue is the most abundant thing in the body, but yet we kind of think in our heads that our whole body is full of what? Bones and muscles and organs. So the only way connective tissue can be the only most abundant organ in the body, tissue in the body, is it has to be in muscles, bones, and organs everywhere. And it is. Okay, so all of that was a super long-winded point to get back to uh, uh, periosteitis, which is inflammation of the periosteum, which is the fascia surrounding a bone. And the reason you get periosteitis um, is from tension on that fascia. So, yes, this spider web here helps keep the tendon from being ripped off your bone. But it doesn't mean that there's not tension on that bone. And if you've had shin splints before, it feels like you ache in the bone. And that's because of all the fascia hanging on that bone and stuff pulling off it. Well, the tibialis and the, the, the tibia and the fibula, actually, tibia and, tibia and fibula have all sorts of fascia around them, give them strength. But that stuff pulls on it. And a lot of the muscles, like your soleus and your anterior tibialis, they're hooked on the front and back of your tibia and all that fascia there. And it, every time it has to lift me up or do something, it is pulling on the bone. So that's why it feels like you ache in the bone sometimes there. That's fascial connections just pulling on stuff. Um, and that's essentially what that is. That's what we use shin splints today to mean. Is we mean usually inflammation of the periosteum. Um, and usually they, it's, it's an overuse injury. Um, from from using all those muscles a lot, and they're just putting incredible amounts of strain um, on that area. Cool, 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 cool. All right. Um, and by the way, responds really well. Fascia is a little avascular. Responds really well to rubbing because you get some you get some uh, blood in that area. And my only difference is when I'm rubbing muscle, I tend to go more directly into it. When I'm rubbing fascia, I tend to go less directly and kind of rub it off the bone. Because I don't, I'm not trying to hurt it. I'm trying to get blood into it and loosen it up and all that kind of stuff. Yeah. The other thing that works really well in fascia, and you guys will hear about this, it's called myofascial therapy. And myofascial therapy is really just going super slow with no oil to catch the fascia here. And believe it or not, I actually don't move forward until my skin lets me move forward. And that's the fascia slowly giving way as you slowly stretch it. Muscles respond to almost anything you do to them if it's really a muscle, but fascia actually tends, fascia, which would include ligaments, tendons, all that stuff, um, and periosteum tends to respond very well to slow, sustained stretching. Um, in fact, if you go fast and hard, you can go really hard, but you got to go slow. And it needs to be sustained because you're trying to stretch out this, this material that's meant to keep your form. Fascia is the reason that my belly is not around my ankles. And so... <laughs> It handles stress very well, and you want to move it slowly and try to stretch it out. So anyway, uh, periosteitis um, is, is shin splints or uh, medial tibial stress syndrome. I've never once heard a massage therapist say that. You can just say shin splints. But the point is shin splints are usually kind of inflammation of the periosteum around the legs and from all the pulling on them. And it, it's an overuse thing. People need to exercise less and get a massage in their legs. And that will help you with tonight's homework, and that's a good thing. Okay. Um, doo, doo, doo. Don't forget, I've said this about the hands before, but the top of the feet, do you see these 
nice lines there going up. Those are not the metatarsals. Those are not bones. Those are tendons. It's not a good or bad thing. I just want to let you know. Like a lot of times, even the stuff we see in the back of our hand, yes, there's bones underneath there, but you're often seeing the tendons running up, and they're slightly different. Just be aware of that. And the bottoms of feet can take 10 times more pressure than the top of feet. So maybe it's not a lot of pressure. I'm not suggesting you should beat everybody up. But I'm suggesting if you can push on my hand with 10 pounds, on the bottom of my foot with 10 pounds of force, the top of my foot may be only one pound of force. The tops of feet are just dramatically more sensitive. Um, and this is true of spa treatments, by the way. If you guys ever do like salt scrubs or things like that when you get into a spa, you can scrub the snot out of a bottom of the foot. On top, you've got to be really gentle. They're very sensitive. They're just not used to the impact. Okay. So hopefully we all know what the femur is. The femur is your thigh bone, right? Yeah. Um, so the femur is the main thing that interacts with your tibia. So what is the name for your knee joint? So this is where the tibia and the, and the femur come together. What would we name a joint where the tibia and the femur come together? And who raised the right? <laughs> My screen is not showing you. The tibial femoral joint. Thank you, sir. Sorry, for whatever reason, it didn't show your hand up. But anyway, thank you. It's the tibial femoral joint. Um, and you're welcome to call it the femoral tibial joint. But it is the tibial femoral joint. That is your knee joint. So looking at this picture... Does the fibula interact with the femur? Does the fibula articulate with the femur? I saw a yes and a no, which I like the feedback either way. Does the fibula touch the femur? No, it doesn't actually. It actually nestles underneath the head of the tibia. And so it does that up by the knee and down by the ankle. So we have two tibiofibular joints. <laughs> this is kind of like your forearms, where one's attaching up here and one's attaching down there, because it kind of rides along the side of your, your, of your tibia. So that's why we have a proximal tibial femoral joint and a distal tibial femoral joint. Yeah. And if you look at the distal area of the tibia and the, the fibula, they both have these bumps on them. Remember what these are called around your ankles? What are these bumps called? I saw somebody Malleolus? Malleolus. Yeah. Malleoluses. Those are protuberances on those bones, but do you see how the talus kind of sticks up in here and actually fits between them? It makes a nice socket that kind of holds your ankle and, and stable. So the malleoluses have that advantage, and the malleoluses do one other thing, which I've mentioned before. What are the malleoluses there? Why do we have these two bumps on the side of our ankles? Just because it's fashionable, makes it harder to wear boots, Keeps my feet from knocking into each other without hitting the malleoluses first. Start Is it to exert the, um, like, uh, the absorb? Oh, I like that. <laughs> yeah. Impact, uh, I Respectfully, sir, I don't think so, but I like how you're thinking. Um, yeah, no. Though they're bone, they're not absorbing a lot of impact. Although, don't get me wrong, all bone, because it's made of fascia, has flex to it. Why do we have these bumps on the side of our ankles? What could they be there for? I was literally wondering that the other night after that insane 200 question test, and I'm swearing that you're clairvoyant because you brought it up in lecture and yeah. I racked one of them last night. So do tell Mr. Papscoff, please don't keep me at the edge of my seat okay. any longer. Okay. So where are most of the muscles found for my hand? Where's most of the power found for my hand? I've got muscles in my hand. That's part of what... But where's most of the power? When I grab something, where's the power coming from? Anybody? Coming from my legs, my face, my hand. 
Does it come from your wrist muscles that are actually? Yeah, it's coming from my forearm, right? So all this meat here, the reason my forearm is thicker here is because this is where the contractile tissue is and these are little tendons that go up into my hand and my hand is actually puppeted from here. There are some tiny muscles in here, but the majority of the power is here. And But you couldn't put my forearm muscles up my hand because I'd have these big fat hands. I wouldn't be able to grab anything. So if you need really articulate hands that can pick up tiny things and do stuff with, you need to have no muscle around here, which basically there is no muscle in your fingers. So how are my fingers moving? Well, they're moving from here, which is why you see my forearm doing that as I wiggle my fingers. That's where the power is coming from. Well, feet, how much muscle would you have to have in your foot to have it do the stuff it does? Where's the muscle found that controls your feet or the muscles found that control your feet? In the back in front of your legs, right? Well, muscles can only do one thing, right? Pull. Well, if a muscle's running up and down my leg, when it pulls, it can, it can pull this way. How do I convert that to doing something with my toe? I need, let me get a better color. I need a pulley. A pulley takes power from here and lets me turn a corner with it. So what I mean by that, just for a clear visual, because this is not a, this is exactly how your feet work. Hold on. So, oh jeez, well, except that your feet don't move up. Oh, sorry, that was me. That was me dropping the foot on the thing. So, let's try it this way. So, if I want to pull my toe down, I can do it from here. And you've got tiny muscles underneath your feet that can pull your toe, right? And that's great. If I have a muscle underneath my foot that pulls my toe, I do have that. And I can do stuff like this, right? But my feet have to hold up my body. What if I stand up on my toes right now? I'm not going to have enough power and a little muscle down here. I'm going to have it up my leg, right? Well, up my leg, it's got to go around a pulley. It's got to go around a wheel. And I know it doesn't sound like it. And then if I pull, I don't know if it will work from here. Hold on, we'll try it. If I pull on here, my toe will still move from up my leg. Well, those pulleys are your malleoluses. You have tendons going here, wrapping around your ankle and going up your leg. You have tendons on the other side, going around your uh, ankle and going up your leg. Your malleoluses are pulleys. They really are these places where wires from down here can go back up your leg. And those wires are tendons. The muscle's up here, and when it pulls, it pulls on my toes. Who here can tell me the three calf muscles? Hopefully everybody. The gastrocnemius, the soleus, and the plantars. Good. Who here can tell me the three muscles found underneath the soleus, the gastrocnemius, and the plantars still on the posterior leg? One goes to the big toe, one goes to the other toes, and one goes to the middle of the foot underneath, but anyway. Anybody? Take a stab at it. Everybody's doing it. Yes, Mr. Blygen, please take it away, sir. I think I got one. Okay. Is it the posterior? Tibialis. Tibialis. Yeah, that's a good one. Yeah. Two more, everybody? What's the one that goes to the big toe? Yes, Miss Walker T. Okay. Flexor halitus longus and flexor digitorium longus? Yes. So, I don't know if that second one's right. No, it's right. Flexor digitorium longus, flexor halitus longus. So, here's my big toe. What's, that, what's this action called, everybody, when I do that with my big toe? No, Miss Mejia. No. What's it called? Circumduction, opposition. Flexion, flexion. Thank you. So we pull this big toe down. We create a flexion of the big toe. If 
by hooking a muscle to it. We can pull it down all day long. And I've got a muscle underneath my foot that does this. But is it powerful enough to lift up my whole body? No. That muscle lives on the back of my leg. The flexor hollicis longus. And it runs a tendon around the malleolus to get to my big toe. So that when it pulls, my big toe goes down. That's happened, but the power is up the leg. Kind of like your calf muscles, except they don't have to go around anything. The calf muscles get to come straight down to here. This guy's got to go around a corner, and it uses the malleolus to do that. And by the way, the reason it doesn't slip off is you've got ligaments that actually keep it in this groove. But it runs around the malleolus essentially like this, and that's how you make it work. So your malleoluses are pulleys to make it work. Yes, Miss Vincent, please. So what what is this in your hand? Or like when I since I've been working out for several years, uh, my hands got thicker. Yeah. What what making them thicker if there's no muscles there? Uh, you're eating food that it's going straight to your hands. You know how you have food like these donuts are gonna go straight to my hips. Well, there's mm -hmm. food that goes straight. No, I'm kidding. Um, no, your hands are getting thicker and stronger. I've got I've got four thumb muscles here that make up this thumb pad. I've got three pinky muscles here that make up this. Those get stronger and bigger. But there's no way this little muscle and this little pinky thing are what's giving me all this power to go lift. I mean, right now, I'm sure, I don't know what you could do with it, but I guarantee you could grab a 100-pound dumbbell and hold it, right? You don't have enough strength in here to do that. You're getting that from up here. So, yes, these will grow. I'm not saying there's no meat down there. There is. There's muscle in here. But there's no way you're getting the power you need. Th these are great for this kind of stuff, like... You know, little stuff that I'm doing with them. It helps give me the fine motor skills because I can articulate very little stuff. But, but along with this pinky, that's there's a, a little muscle here called the flexor digitorum brevis. And it's a tiny little muscle here that goes to my, fle I'm sorry, flexor digiti minimi, I apologize. Flexor digiti minimi is right here. It literally does this, right? But I've got a flexor digitorum longus down here. It's actually called the palmaris and other stuff. The fact is that it hooks onto all these and it's got all that, right? And this, I, I know my forearm is not impressive, but the fact is there are just two little bones there. This is, all this meat is muscle and its job is to flex my wrist, help me grab really hard stuff. So <clears throat> most of your hands and feet have two muscles doing the same thing. They have a brevis in general moving up the fingers and the thumb or the big toe and the little toes, but then they've got a longest that lives in the forearm or up your leg that's giving you the really big power. So okay. I'm assuming while your hand grew, I'm assuming your forearms grew too. Yeah. Okay. <laughs> Good. Yes. I think it would be almost impossible for that not to happen because you just, you use them together. So yes, Thank you. you've got meat in your hands down here, but by the way, once I get up here to my um, phalanges, there is no muscle there. There's just tendon hooking to pieces of my phalanges. So this meat you fill in your fingers is tendons, other fascia, and possibly fat, which is not a bad thing. You should have a little bit of fat in your hands. Uh, do not start worrying about your hands, you know, needing to lose weight. But the fact is they should have a little padding in them. But anyway, there's no actual contractile tissue in my phalanges. This, this action right here has to come from down here somewhere. It's not living up here. It really is a string up here that just goes whoop. There is some living in my hand that'll do it, but nothing up to the fingers. And the power comes from my forearm or the power comes from my leg. And your malleoluses are pulleys that allow power coming from here to change direction. And we use pulleys all the time, we don't think about it. But literally a pulley just allows, just to make even one more visual, We kind of take it for granted, but most of our muscles that we've learned so far, we pull them and they go like this. But what if I want to pull something from over here, but I'm down here? And that's when I need something like this, where it goes over the top of something, and when I pull it here, it goes across. It allows me to change direction. That's all they do. Does that make sense? Miss Mejia, you have your inquisitive look on your face. Even this, by the way, you guys have all put on a scarf before? I'm pulling forwards, but my hand's going backwards. That's impossible. But my neck is a pulley right now. 
So I can pull this hand forward and the other one goes back. Normally it wouldn't work that way. Normally it'd be over here, but this allows me to change direction. That's all it's doing. And ripping the hairs off the back of my neck. So I hope you're happy. Okay. Cool. Any other questions about that? So one of the neat things, by the way, and I'm not really good about doing this, but most of my friends are, I don't know why, <laughs> but they always make sure to rub around the malleoluses. Not hard, and it feels really good because there's all these tendons, this avascular material going from the back and around these things to the front, um, and so it's just a good little, nice little added touch area to kind of get when you're doing feet and add a little detail and work around the malleoluses. So, so try that. Yeah. Yeah. Cool. All right. So the malleoluses act as pulleys. They also create this nice little pocket that the talus sits in there before the rest of the foot comes in to play. Um, do you guys see the tibial tuberosity on the tibia up here? Oh, you can't see it. No, because I stopped showing it, of course. Let's try this. Thank you, by the way. Let's try it again. Okay. Do you guys see the tibial tuberosity up here? This bump here that says tibial tuberosity? Anybody? Good. What attaches there? What is that bump doing? What attaches there? Yes, Miss Estes, I feel like you're going to say something. I am. Um, the hamstrings via the patella ligament. Ooh. Well, I love where you were going with this. <laughs> I do. Right. Um, which side of the legs are the hamstrings found on? The front. Mm, which side is this bump found on? I oh, mean, wait, wait, wait. Wait a second. Anterior. Anterior. I caught it. Okay. So what, what, what's it inserting into the tibial tuberosity? Oh, that's on the back, huh? That's on the posterior? No, sorry. I confused you. You confused me, but I'm the one who's supposed to know what's going on. So let me correct things. <laughs> The tibial tuberosity is on your anterior leg. It's on the front of your of your leg, right below your knee. Okay. So my problem is your hamstrings are not on the front of your femur. They're on the back of your leg. So oh, there's no quad. way they're attaching in there. So what? what did I say this? hamstrings? Yeah. Yeah, no. I meant the quads. <laughs> yeah. I think you really did, by the way. And then I blew it because I was like, yeah, because it just sounded so good. Yeah, the quads, yeah. they all insert into the patella, like this part, you're right, patella, and then the patella ligament goes in there, and that's what that bump is for. I just want to point out where we are right now. Um, and that's it. Um, by the way, just to let you guys know, the medial lateral intercondylar tubercles, you will probably never say that in your life, by the way, so don't worry, because you'll never see these. But the medial and lateral intercondylar tubercles are where your ligaments inside your knee attach. And that's why you'll never probably say it or see it because they're inside your knee. So if you see the ligaments inside somebody's knee, you probably did something wrong in your massage and should probably call somebody quickly. I just want to explain why that's there. Those are, those are, there's, there's ligaments inside holding your knees together because knees are really tricky. And we will study the knee in this, in this chapter, which is kind of cool. Uh, this is the backside of the tibia and fibula. Anybody have an idea what this, there's a line here called the soleal line. What do you suppose has an origin on the soleal line? Anybody? Origin on the soleal line? Could it be the soleus? It is the soleus, yeah! And does the soleal line, what bone is it on in this picture? Tibia. Tibia, yeah. And it does not cross over the knee because the soleus doesn't cross over the knee. The soleus hooks down below the knee and goes down to your ankle. But anyway, that's the soleal line. And your soleus, believe it or not, does kind of hook onto the back of your leg at a slight little angle, although it's very hard to feel. But... You'll see it when we study it here. Because what's kind of cool here is you guys know about the calves, but we've never actually studied them individually. So we're going to get to all that kind of cool stuff. Uh, the patella. What is your patella? I mean, in easy terms. I think I saw some. Kneecap. Kneecap. And what type of bone is it? A what? 
Patella. Pat patella. Patella is the bone, and it is your kneecap. It's a bone. That's, yeah, sesamoid. It's a bone completely wrapped in fascia. Sesamoid bone. Um, and Miss Mejia, not to beat this in the ground, by the way, you're right, there's other floating bones, but just so I'm clear, the one difference is, like the hyoid bone isn't wrapped in fascia. This guy, you can't even find he's wrapped in fascia, but I agree with you, they're both floating. Don't get me wrong. Um, cool. This is a knee bent over a massage table, just somebody sitting at the edge of a massage table. You see this medial epicondyle where it says the adductor tubercle here. What do we suppose inserts into the adductor tubercle? Anybody? Adductor tubercle? The uh, adductor medialis. Okay, I love the adductor on the inside. <laughs> well, that's good. All adductors are on the inside though, right? Because they're between your legs to pull your legs together. So you're absolutely right, it's an adductor. Which adductor inserts in the ad adductor magnus? Does the adductor, uh, well, there's not an adductor medialis. <laughs> did you mean, did you mean vastus medialis? You know, I don't know. My brain is still waffling from that test, Mr. Tapscott. I understand that. It was intense, I'm not going to lie. No, you're right. And we're dumping a lot of stuff together now, right? And we're hopping around and saying, you got to connect this over here and stuff. But guys, how many adductors do you have? Five. Thank you. And this is down by the knee. Which one is long enough to get down by the knee? Maybe gracilis? Yeah, gracilis. So, but doesn't gracilis cross over the knee? Right? Adductor longus. That's a great guess, sir. It's wrong, but it's a great guess. Um, it's actually the adductor magnus that goes all the way Magna. down. Magnus. Yeah. But, and by the way, I didn't even care about the right answer from any of you. I just cared about this kind of thought process because I'm trying to help you piece together information so it stays in your head. And just to do that kind of thought process of like, well, it's called the adductor tubercle, so it must be an adductor muscle. You guys got that right away. Beautiful. And then to go, well, it can't be the pectineus or the brevis. They're too small. And it can't be the gracilis because it's too long and it goes across the knee. This thing isn't across the knee. So it's got to be the longest or the magnus or something. Yes, Mr. Blygen, please, sir. So the magnus is the one that is considered like one of the hamstrings, right? Well, it's in the same region. Yeah. And it well, crosses and it, over to the side of the knee. Yeah, and it's it's so far back, even though it's medial, it's so far back it can act a little bit like a hamstring. And it's actually quite big. And it's the one that takes a little hiatus and then it jumps over and attaches in the adductor tubercle. Yeah. But again, what I was really trying to do is help you guys with the language, because that's what killed us on the test, right? Is to look at stuff and be like, oh, okay, I don't remember that, but I know this, that kind of thing. And do we see the pes anserinus attachment site here? Underneath the knee on the medial side. Pes anserinus means what? Yes. Goose foot. Um, and what three muscles, Mr. Blygen, make up the goose foot? Rosartorius? Yes. Front, middle, and back. So Sartorius was your front one. Give me a muscle from between your legs now. The adductor longus. So does the adductor longus cross over the knee joint? No. So, oh, no, I got one. So which adductor crossed over the knee joint, sir? You can't give up that easy. The... There you go. The way it crossed over the knee joint, so then we're looking at... I said Sartorius, right? Sartorius, yes, but that's not an adductor. But you're right, Sartorius is correct. Yes. <laughs> that's when you said I got one right and I'm out. <laughs> so what adductor muscle of your five adductors crosses over the knee joint. Pectineus? That's your short one up there. I don't know, man. I'm lost today. Yeah? Anybody want to help them out? Bicep femoris. 
Uh, actually, by the way, you were 100% correct that biceps femoris crossed over the knee joint, but it doesn't make up the pes anserinus, but you are right, crossed over the knee joint. Um, any, <laughs> yeah, yes, Ms. Robson, you're going to say something? Yeah, I believe it's the gracious muscle, gracilis. Gracilis, yes, that is your longest adductor muscle that goes across the knee. So we got sartorius, we got um, gracilis from your adductor group, and Miss Modis was on the right track. For those of you who know, she just picked the wrong muscle from that group, but she picked a back muscle on the back of the leg, meaning, and she picked a muscle that crossed over the knee. So she did really well, but she picked one on the lateral side. We need something on the medial side. Yes, you're right, Ms. Mejia, unless you're asking for a timeout, and then you're wrong. The semi-tendinosis. semi-tendinosis. Semi Get one from the front, one from the middle, one from the back for inner knee stability. Yeah. Um, okay. Let's, that's it. I'm going to stop right there, because...